Hello, my name's Ian Hawkins. You're listening to The Why Word, the podcast that gets under the skin of entrepreneurs, business leaders, creatives, and people who make things happen to find out what makes them tick. Coming up later in the program, you will hear this. You know, we've been told this myth that um, humans are just data, and with enough data, you can predict all human behavior. Amazon keeps recommending to me books I've, in fact, written. For me, creativity and learning are what matter most to me. In some circumstances, that made me a lot of money. It's also turned out in some circumstances, it's made me absolutely none. I don't really care what people think I should and should not be doing. I mean, I just, you know, I I follow my nose and I do the things I want to do. Today's guest is an entrepreneur, CEO and keynote speaker. Her books include The Naked Truth, A Working Woman's Manifesto About Business and What Really Matters, and Willful Blindness, Why We Ignore the Obvious at Our Peril. She's currently Professor of Practice at University of Bath School of Management, but if you've not enrolled, you're more likely to have seen one of her TED Talks, seen her on the TV show Secret Millionaire, or listened to her Sonny-nominated radio plays. Margaret Heffernan, welcome to The Y Word. Thanks so much for inviting me. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Let's start from the top. What is a professor of practice? Um, It really means that I didn't uh, get there by doing a PhD. It means that um, I'm a professor because I've had lots of practice with management and running businesses. So it's it's, it's a kind of interesting way that business schools found a way to bring in what they call practitioners to teach students with the benefit of their experience rather than purely academic work. So it's more sort of school of life, but you're adding the, on theory it looks like this, but in reality we do that. Exactly, exactly. I'm intrigued by this idea of willful blindness because that seems to speak to quite a lot of things that are going on in the world right now. People not seeing the things that are straight in front of their faces. What, what was it that made you start that, writing that as a topic? Essentially, I was writing two plays for the BBC about the collapse of Anron, and I encountered in the trial of the chairman and the chief exec the legal term willful blindness, which says that if there are things you could know and should know and somehow manage not to know, that you've been deemed to be willfully blind. You've had an opportunity for knowledge, but you shirked it. And I remember thinking that was a very high standard and that I probably hadn't lived up to that myself sometimes in my own businesses. And at the same time, the banks started to collapse and many people were saying, oh my goodness, we couldn't have seen this coming. And I thought, well, actually, people have talked about it coming for at least three years. So this is definitely willful blindness. And then it just made me think back, you know, to my history and think about the many situations, you know, the pedophilia and the Catholic Church. And it just dawned on me that there was a lot of this stuff around. So I became very fascinated by how does it work? Why does it happen? Why is it apparently so hard to overcome? And why does it happen? Because it seems totally counterintuitive that you get especially when we talk about about elections and people voting against their best interests because someone tells them something they want to hear even though they know it's probably not true so there are many many reasons right um one of them is we tend to stick to people that are like us so we tend to see what they see and have a rather narrower focus on life than we could have Um, We have really mental models of how the world works and we're very drawn to the things that confirm those models and tend to marginalize, trivialize, ignore whatever doesn't speak to our model. Um, We're often simply too busy, tired, distracted to pay attention to what's happening. Um, You know, a lot of our belief in multitasking is to blame here because your brain won't multitask. When we work in groups, um, we tend sometimes to see things that are going wrong, but we're too conflict averse, so we don't raise them. There's this staggering statistic that asked if they had issues at work that they were concerned by, but didn't raise. 85% of executives said that that described them. We're also obedient by nature. We will do what we're asked to do and are so keen to please that we might not consider whether it's moral or ethical or not. That's exacerbated in groups where we want to belong. And it's also the case that if 
everybody can see a problem and nobody thinks it's their responsibility. So we think somebody will deal with it, but that somebody is never me. And money is very implicated. The more we think about money, the less we think about other people. So the more we make money an incentive at work, for example, the less we think about the moral relationships we have with them. So there's a whole nest of driving forces, including bureaucracy and hierarchy, that makes us blind to many of the things we most need to pay attention to. What can we actually do to get through it? Because it's, it's really attractive to people. They, they won't give up their, their perceived notions of things, will they? Is there a... Is there a magic bullet that can break through? Well, I mean, I think first of all, you know, the way that we live and work, whether we can learn, relearn how to pay attention, how to focus is important. Making an effort to know and spend time with people who are different from us is important and developing the skills to do that well. I think learning the skills of negotiation and how to raise very awkward topics is important. And I think that it's, you know, I think organizations that are less hierarchical, less bureaucratic, and make people work fewer insane hours are safer places. And I think also that, of course, um, you know, the quality of debate and disagreement within an organization is going to be key to how blind it is or isn't. So you've got to get used to having dissenting voices around you anyway. Absolutely. If you don't have dissenting voices, what are all those people doing? <laughs> Good point. Speaking of, of dissenting voices, I spend quite a lot of time now on social media where it is just a, a shouting match between people. And especially in this time of COVID, we're all excited about the possibilities of digital. Do you think there needs to be a better balance of you know using technology and using more human skills yeah absolutely i mean i write extensively about this thing that's known as the automation paradox which is you know the more we outsource to technology the more we lose the skills that the technology undertakes for us um, it means that the more that we um, depend on our devices to choose the people we like the more those devices are going to choose people just like us. And so, you know, I'm not by any stretch of the imagination an anti-tech person. I think there are some chores that technology takes over from us, which I'm happy to hand over, like remembering all the phone numbers of everybody I've ever met. Um, but there are other things um, like choosing who to spend time with that actually I do not want to give up. And I do not want to give up making decisions about things that matter in life. And if that means I have to make decisions about some things that are a bit trivial, just to kind of keep my decision-making mind exercised, I am very prepared to do that because I'm definitely not going to let decision-making about my life be handed over to multinational corporations that don't know me or care about me. I was thinking about how we how we manage our time and and each other and and the technology we use, and I thought to myself, what we need uh, nobody likes to be micromanaged unless you're a computer. So we need nano management for our robots, and we need macro management for people. Is that maybe in the right ballpark? Yeah, I think in general, you know, I, I, so I make a distinction between two kinds of work. There is work that's complicated which means that it's very linear, it's quite rules bound, and it's very predictable. And I think technology is brilliant for that because it optimizes for precision and speed and scale. I think there are other kinds of work which, are, which is complex, where there is a lot of ambiguity, where there are many factors, many of which we can't see, where there may be patterns, but they don't repeat themselves regularly. So there's a lot of ambiguity and expertise, even technological expertise, can't always catch up because things change too fast. And in those environments, I think human judgment does much better, not only because it often makes better judgments in the moment, because these are unpredictable moments, but also because those decisions have greater legitimacy. Yeah, well, I, I hear this a lot from the RPA people that I, that I work with. Uh, that, that the computers are very good at coming up with the facts, but you still need a human being there to have the human interaction with, with the person on the other end of the phone who might be furious or angry or confused or any one of a number of things that a computer just can't cope with. You know, we've been sold this myth that um, humans are just data and with enough data, you can predict all human behavior. 
that has not turned out to be true. And as a consequence, even the vast amounts of data that companies hold on us proves to be a poor predictor of what we want and who we are. Um, I mean, the simplest, cheapest example is um, that Amazon keeps recommending to me books I've in fact written. So, you know, and that's a pretty simple, basic level. So I don't want a system like this making assumptions about me based on other people who might be kind of like me, but aren't me making important decisions for me or my life or people I love. Uh, I have a similar thing with Amazon, which is there's another Ian Hawkins who's a military historian. And now if you Google my name, you get my picture, but his book. So <laughs> <laughs> This artificial intelligence is genuinely quite stupid. Well, good, because he's about 60 years older than I am. And uh, he... <laughs> He's looking. He's. I. I never think of myself as a good-looking guy, but I'm. I'm pretty good for for ninety-eight. Right. <laughs> you. You seem to be some of the likes to cut a, against receive wisdom. I mean, that's the whole point of bringing out a book is it, it goes against the the flow. Because in a bigger prize, you talk against the idea of competition, and in Beyond Measure, you talk about small changes adding up to big differences. Are you just finding a point of difference for the sake of it, or is this borne out in, in your experience? Well, I mean, I only, you know, I only write books that I believe in quite passionately. I don't need to write. Um, writing is probably the most time-consuming and least profitable of all the things that I do. But I just am, I guess, a, a natural-born skeptic. And I'm very struck by the degree to which we swallow a lot of received wisdom, some of which might have been true once but is no longer true, and some of which probably was always wrong but somehow became popular. And in a way, willful blindness is a classic example of that because, you know, we had this notion that we're all so smart and we all make such great decisions. And clearly that was not true. As, as, you know, many unpredictable events keep telling us. I wrote, I wrote Beyond Measure because I was kind of fed up to the back teeth with these gigantic change programs and so-called transformation programs, which have a terrible, terribly low success rate and which are trying to impose a superstructure of ideologies on top of people, where actually thinking of people as people often creates far more change, much more quickly, in a much more relevant way, and much um, much more cheaply in a way that ignobles and doesn't um, diminish human beings. And I've written Uncharted because I think people have very strange and ultimately wrong ideas about the predictability of the future. And I think it's only when you accept its inherent uncertainty that you can start to think about the future in a more productive and creative way. But what about when big things come along, like, you know, the COVID shutdown, when these big things come along and we're forced into change and indeed forced into transformation, what options do we have? Well, we have lots of options and lots of people have reacted, of course, to the lockdown in very, very different ways. You know, some people have found it life enhancing and they've been, you know, doing yoga and catching up on years of sleep and spending more time with their children. Other people have gone into a kind of desperate depression. Many people have become much more connected with their communities and much more involved in the in addressing the COVID crisis. So I think, you know, there is no one narrative around lockdown at all. And while we may all be in it together, the experiences that we're having are spectacularly diverse. I think, you know, there's a lot about epidemics in, in my book, Uncharted, um, not because I could see this coming, which obviously I could not, but I thought it was a, a, a perfect example of how uncertainty is ineradicably in the world. And there are some extremely smart and good ways to think about how to deal with that, that people involved in epidemics have developed. Recently, a friend asked me what thought leadership actually is. I think I could just send him a link to this recording by way of explanation. I'm so pleased Margaret was able to come on the show. She's got these big ideas and she's really happy to share them. She understands technology, but she doesn't think it's the only answer to the world's problems. And she's a CEO and a company founder, but she isn't a cash-hungry, profit-before-people sort of person. Margaret mentioned the book that came out of her play on Enron, 
And I thought this was an area that we could dig a little deeper into. You mentioned about writing not being the most lucrative way of making uh, making money. So I'm intrigued why you wrote a radio play uh, about Enron, of all things, because it definitely wasn't for the money. Why did you do it for the radio? Well, I did it for radio because I spent many years as a radio drama producer, and I absolutely adore radio. I mean, the, the cliche that's always used in radio drama is they're the best pictures in the world because the pictures are all in your mind. So it's a very intimate way of communicating with people. And I just thought there were many, many aspects of the story of Enron that were not about big, you know, people in big jobs. They were about individuals kind of going along with the flow. And, you know, this is something that obsesses me a lot, which is the power of working environments to make people lose their way. And while everybody had focused on, you know, the numbers and the big bad guys, I was much more interested in the thousands and thousands of employees who had enabled, you know, the corruption that was Enron which was bad in itself, but also it had defrauded fragile individual shareholders and ruined their lives. And I thought there was a human face to the tragedy that nobody really cared about, nobody really thought about. And it seemed to me that the moral lesson of Enron was that could have been any of us, just like it could have been any of us selling subprime mortgages to poor people. You know, the final solution in Nazi Germany isn't possible without the collusion of thousands and thousands and thousands of people who do what they're told. And this to me is, you know, one of the most haunting aspects of organizational life that we dare not lose sight of. It's easy to get very exercised about the the evils of the Holocaust, but what's difficult is doing anything at all about the banalities of the Holocaust that enabled it to happen. Right, right. I mean, people sat in Auschwitz keeping files. You know, they were just doing their jobs. I'm sad that, you know, people sat in countrywide keeping files of mortgages that nobody could possibly expect to do other than bankrupt the people who took them out. You know, these aren't, these aren't big, you know, stage villains. These are individuals exactly like you and me. So tell me about radio. What was it that got you into radio? I got a job working in radio as a temp, as a uh, dictation typist, and thought, this is really fun. I love the people. It's very cool, very energetic. And I started off in the world at one and soon realized I was not a news hound. But, you know, I, then I moved into drama and just absolutely loved it. Probably the best job I've ever had in my life. So I was working in Broadcasting House. And the last job I had in radio was as the editor for Radio 4 Features. Well, you've done quite a lot of media appearances yourself. Uh, things like um, Secret Millionaire. Has your background given you an insight into what stuff you should and should not be doing? I don't really care what people think I should and should not be doing. Um, I mean, actually, in retrospect, I wish I hadn't done The Secret Millionaire. But um, I mean, I just, you know, I, I follow my nose and I do the things I want to do. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of unstrategic about this, too, because I think that the most unoriginal work is done by people who are trying to be pleasers. And the world is full of those people. You know, they don't need any more. And I'm much more interested in in trying to make a contribution that I think is interesting and unusual and might provoke different kinds of thinking. And, you know, and, and sometimes I, people understand that and are interested in it, and sometimes they're not. So, so what was your regret? Was it that you were taking part in somebody else's narrative? Um, no, I didn't mind that at all. Um, I felt that the process by which the film was made, I mean, was not terribly honest. And I thought, in retrospect, Probably some of the people involved knew exactly what the game was. And um, so everybody was kind of playing along. So I thought it was kind of phony. I mean, I think, you know, one the main reason I did it is I thought it would be a de uh, an extremely ex interesting experience for myself, which it categorically was. Um, but I thought in terms of the ethics of the program making, I, it was something I would have preferred not to be associated with. But we've had a couple of people on the show who've, who were apprentice contestants and their, their mantra is, we, well, we knew we were good, but we also realised we had to up our game and be more entertaining if we were going to get the screen time. Yeah, so that's about being phonier, you know, and I think actually in The Apprentice it's pretty grotesque because it encourages people to be more vicious than they already are. 
Um, I didn't feel that with the secret millionaire. With the secret millionaire, I just thought that that quite vulnerable people were being used in ways that I wished, in retrospect, I hadn't been part of. Yeah, I think it's quite hard to feel sorry for any of the contestants in Apprentice, isn't it? Because they do set themselves up to be, you know, a bit obnoxious. Yeah, and they are selected for those qualities. I'm liking this idea of small changes ultimately building up to something bigger, because actually it's how how most of us make any changes, whether it's losing weight or giving up the cigarettes or getting fit, it's a small change and accumulates over time. What, what, what small changes do you think you've made that have actually made a big difference overall? Mm, what an interesting question. I think I've, I've made a lot of small changes in terms of my work routine. For example, in terms of, you know, not ever, ever really working late, if I can possibly help it. Um, trying to stick to pretty rigidly to a, maximum an eight hour day. Um, I've made very big changes in terms of my sleeping routine um, because I used to suffer a lot from insomnia. You know, when the gyms were still open, I was pretty fanatical about getting four days of exercise every week. I have a sort of belief that I really want to be available and responsive to people. So I answer emails from people I've never heard of before and I take and podcasts that may not have a deep, obvious strategic value because A, I think it's the right thing to do and B, I'm very persuaded that you actually can't pick winners and so you shouldn't. So things like that, I think. I mean, during the pandemic, one of the things I did is I, I thought, you know, most of us don't have very much to talk about. So I just started sending postcards to people of kind of very beautiful pictures. And that was surprisingly impactful because people loved getting them and often sent pictures back. And, you know, we didn't have a lot to say to each other. It was really just saying, I'm thinking of you and isn't this picture fabulous? Um, And it was, you know, it was a classic example of something being easy, quick, very touching and very personal. You're you're very collegiate in the way you work. You seem to have a very flat hierarchy, you know, picking up the phone and, and getting in touch with people. Has that always been part of your makeup? Um, yes, very much so. You know, never more so than when I was running tech companies. I felt very passionately that I didn't want a very ornate organizational structure. I've never been terribly keen on job descriptions. I mean, this may sound a little loosey-goosey, but I've always basically thought, well, hire lots of great people, focus on hard, interesting problems, and people kind of figure it out for themselves. Now, I wouldn't call it what has since become self-management because I don't think it was quite as loose as that. But I tried to run companies that were very unbureaucratic and just allowed people huge amounts of space for personal growth. And I think that's what many people who working who worked for me found. Um, it's one reason why many of us are still friends. And I think it's why we're able to do some pretty amazing things that nobody would ever done before. As I listen to you, I'm, th- I'm imagining the people that would be listening to this going, right, how do I get to be a millionaire? How do I get to be uh, a tech entrepreneur? What, I wonder what Margaret's, you know, three lessons of, of uh, red tooth success are going to be. And you don't seem to have satisfied <laughs> that particular listener. <laughs> what yeah. it sounds to me is that you've created a sort of, positive feedback loop around yourself and that you've all risen together? Well, maybe. I mean, I, you know, I have never been strategic about my, my career. I have moved towards things that interested me. I probably have a low boredom threshold. Um, I'm very willing to try things I've never tried before. Uh, so quite a high appetite for risk. And I think if there's any clear narrative line across all the things that I've done, it's that I have a gigantic love of working with really creative people. And, um, and it's my idea of fun. And I think most of them thought it was fun to work with me. So I've, you know, I've really just, I mean, I really just kind of followed my nose. I never thought I would be a tech entrepreneur. So, you know, I'm a very big believer that in pursuing careers, it, you know, it should really be about what are the things that matter most to you. For me, creativity and learning are what matter most to me. In some circumstances, that made me a lot of money. 
It's also turned out in some circumstances, it's made me absolutely numb. So I've also always had a theory that you keep your overheads low and you live on whatever you are. So, you know, that's in a nutshell, I guess, Margaret's theory of life. And it's not a bad one. I'll tell you what, we'll, we'll close up with the question I always ask, which is, it's the dinner party game. You can have anybody you like, living, dead or fictional. But my twist is it has to be a business lunch rather than a dinner party. So who would your ultimate business lunch guest be? Well, it's not going to sound like a, a business person, but it is. And it's probably the only person I've ever really, 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 really wanted to interview and failed to interview. And that's Issey Mayaki. Now, Issey Mayaki, in my mind, is one of the greatest clothes designers of all time. Completely original, staggeringly creative, and running, of course, an extremely successful business, uh, which doesn't really look at fashion. It doesn't follow fashion in the slightest. And it's an organization and an ethos I just have endless respect for. Margaret Heffern, and thank you so much for your time. It's been so lovely having you on. Well, thanks for a marvellous conversation and great questions. You're very welcome. Thank you. Now, I didn't know whether I should leave that last comment in or not, but trust me, dear listener, if Margaret Heffernan told you you ask good questions, you would leave it in as well. Thanks very much indeed to Margaret for coming and joining us on The Y Word. Terrific having such an illustrious guest. We could have talked all day. And yes, I did send her a postcard afterwards to say thank you. If you'd like to get in touch with the show, you will find my contact details on a LinkedIn URL in the show notes. Do get in touch. Drop me a line. Let me know what you like about the show. Let me know what you think could be improved. I'm always open to suggestions. Uh, Do remember to put in that it's about the podcast when you connect with me and then I'll know that you're legit and I will make sure I click accept. Finally, thank you for lending me your ears, dear listener. I appreciate both of them, particularly the left. Uh, It's always been my own personal favourite. You've been listening to The Y Word. My name's Ian Hawkins. Have a great time till the next time.